TensorFlow PyTorch these systems, they weren't actually designed for LLMs. Like that, that was not that was not a thing. And so, what, where TensorFlow actually has amazing power in terms of scale and deployment and things like that, and I think Google is, I mean, maybe not unmatched, but they're like incredible in terms of their capabilities and, and gigantic scale. Um, many researchers are using PyTorch. Right, and so PyTorch doesn't have those same capabilities, and so what Modular can do is it can help with that. Now, if you take a step back and you say, like, what is Modular doing? Right, so Modular has like a a bitter enemy that we're fighting against in the industry, and it's one of these things where everybody knows it, but nobody is usually willing to talk about it. The bitter enemy, the bitter thing that we have to destroy, yeah. that we're all struggling with, and it's like all around, it's like fish can't see water, mm -hmm. is complexity. Sure, yes, it's complexity. <laughs> right. that, that was very philosophical of you. That was very <laughs> and, so, <sad. laughs> and so if you look at it, yes, it is on the hardware side. <laughs> yes. All these all these accelerators, all these software stacks that go with the accelerator, all these, like, there's massive complexity over there. You look at what's hap happening on the modeling side. Massive amount of complexity. Like, things are changing all the time. People are inventing. Turns out the research is not done, <laughs> right? And so people want to be able to move fast. Transformers are amazing, but there's a ton of diversity even within transformers. And what's the next transformer, right? And you look into serving, mm -hmm. also huge amounts of complexity. It turns out that all the cloud providers, right, have all their very weird but very cool hardware for networking and all this kind of stuff. And it's all very complicated. People aren't using that. You look at classical serving, right? There, there's this whole world of people who know how to write high performance servers with zero copy networking and like all, all this fancy. Uh, Asynchronous I/O and like all these fancy things in the in in the serving community, very little of that has pervaded into the machine learning world, mm -hmm. right? And why is that? Well, it's because again, these systems have been built up over many years. They they haven't been rethought. There hasn't been a first principles approach to this. Mm -hmm. And so what Modular is doing is we're saying, okay, we've built many of these things. Like so, I've worked on TensorFlow and TPUs and things like that. Other folks on our team have like are, worked on PyTorch Core. We've worked on Onyx Runtime. We've worked on many of these other systems. And so built systems like the Apple accelerators and all that kind of stuff. Like our team is quite amazing. And so one of the things that roughly everybody at Modular is grumpy about is that when you're working on one of these projects, you have a first order goal. Mm -hmm get the hardware to work, get the system to enable one more model, get this product out the door, enable the specific workload or make it uh, solve this problem for this, this product team, right? Mm -hmm. And nobody's been given a chance to actually do that step back. And so we as an industry, we didn't take two steps forward. We took like 18 steps mm -hmm. forward in terms of all this really cool technology across compilers and systems and runtimes and heterogeneous compute and like all this kind of stuff. And like all this technology has been you know, I wouldn't say uh, beautifully designed, but it's been proven in different quadrants. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you look at Google with TPUs, massive, huge exaflops of compute strapped together in, into machines that researchers are programming in Python in a notebook. That's huge. It's That's amazing. It's incredible. Right? Yeah. It's incredible. And so you look at the technology that goes into that, and the the algorithms are actually quite general. And so... Lots of other hardware out there and lots of other teams out there don't have the sophistication or the, maybe the the years working on it or the the budget or whatever that Google does, right? And so they should be getting access to the same algorithms, but they just don't have that, right? And so what Modular is doing is we're saying, cool, this is not research anymore. Like we've we've built auto tuning in many systems, we've built programming languages, right? <laughs> and so like have have you know implemented C have implemented Swift, have implemented many of these things. And so you know this it, it's hard, but it's not research. Mm -hmm. And you look at accelerators. Well, we know there's a bunch of different weird kind of accelerators, but they actually cluster together, right? And you look at GPUs. Well, there's a couple of major vendors of GPUs, and they maybe don't always get along, but their architectures are very similar. You look at CPUs. CPUs are still super important for the deployment side of things. And you see new, new architectures coming out from all the cloud providers and things like this, and they're all super important to the world, right? But they don't have the 30 years of development that the entrenched people do, right? And so what modular can do is we're saying, okay, all this complexity, like it's not, it's not bad complexity, it's actually innovation, <laughs> right? And so it's innovation that's happening and it's for good reasons, but I have sympathy for the poor software people, right? I mean, again, I'm a generally a software person too, I love hardware, but software people wanna build applications and products and solutions that scale over many years, 
they don't want to build a solution for one generation of hardware with one vendor's tools, right? And because of this, they need something that scales with them. They need something that works on cloud and mobile, right? Because, you know, their product manager said, hey, I want it to be, have lower latency and it's better for personalization or whatever they decide, right? Products evolve. And so the challenge with the machine learning technology and the infrastructure that we have today in the industry is that it's all these point solutions. Mm -hmm. And because there are all these point solutions, it means that as your product evolves, you have to like switch to different technology stacks or switch to a different vendor. And what that does is that slows down progress. So basically, a lot of the things we've developed in those little uh, silos for machine learning tasks, you want to make that the first class citizen of a general purpose programming language that can then be compiled across all these kinds of hardware. Well, so it's, it's not really about a programming language. I mean, the programming language is a component of the mission, mm -hmm. right? And the mission is, our not literal, but our joking mission is to save the world from terrible AI software. <laughs> Excellent, I love okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, if you look at this mission, you need a syntax. Mm -hmm. So that's, you, so yes, you need a programming language, right? And and it, like, we wouldn't have to build the programming language if one existed, mm -hmm. right? So if Python was already good enough, then cool, we would just used it, right? We're not just doing very large scale, expensive engineering projects for the sake of it. Like it's to solve a problem, right? It's also about um, uh, accelerators. It's also about exotic numerics and bfloat 16 and matrix multiplications and convolutions and like this this kind of stuff. Um, within the stack, there are things like uh, kernel fusion. It's a esoteric but really important thing that leads to much better performance and much more general research hackability together. Right? And, and so, that that's enabled by the ASICs. That's enabled by certain hardware. So well, it's like, where's the dance between? Uh, I mean, there's several questions here. Like, yeah. how do you add a piece of hardware to this stack? Yeah. If a new piece of, like, if I have this genius invention uh, of a specialized accelerator, yeah. how do I add that to the modular framework? And also, how does modular as a standard start to define the kind of the hardware that should be developed? Yeah. So let me take a step back and talk about status quo. Okay. Yes. And so um, if you go back to TensorFlow 1, PyTorch 1, the, this kind of time frame, um, and these have all evolved and gotten way more complicated. So let's go back to the the glorious simple days, mm -hmm. right? These things basically were CPUs and CUDA. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you say, go do a dense layer, and a dense layer has a matrix multiplication in it, right? And so when you say that, you say, go do this big operation, a matrix multiplication, and if it's on a GPU, kick off a CUDA kernel. If it's on a CPU, go do like an Intel algorithm or something like that with the Intel MKL, okay? Now, that's really cool if you're either NVIDIA or Intel, right? But then more hardware comes in, <laughs> right? And and on one axis, you have more hardware coming in. On the other hand, you have an explosion of innovation in AI. Mm -hmm. And so what happened with both TensorFlow and PyTorch is that the explosion of innovation in AI has led to, it's not just about matrix multiplication and convolution. These things have now like 2,000 different operators. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have, I don't know how many pieces of hardware out there are out there. It's a lot, <laughs> okay? It's, it's, not, it's not even hundreds, it's probably thousands, okay? And across all of Edge and across like all, all the different things. That, that are exists. used at scale. Yeah, exactly. I mean, also, AI, it's not just like AI is a everywhere. Yeah. No, it's not a handful of TPU alternatives. Correct. It's, 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 it's every, every phone, often with many different right. chips inside of it from different yeah, vendors. From, right. Like it's, AI is, Everywhere, it's a thing, right? Why are they all making their own chips? Like, why, why is everybody making their own thing? Uh, well, so because- Is that a good thing, for sure? So Chris's philosophy on hardware? Yeah. Right, so my philosophy is that there isn't one right solution, right? And so I think that, again, we're at the end of Moore's Law, specialization happens. Yeah. If, you, if you're building, if you're training GPT-5, <laughs> you want some crazy supercomputer data center thingy, if you're, making a smart camera that runs on batteries, you want something that looks very different. If you're building a phone, you want something that looks very different. If you have something like a laptop, you want something that looks maybe similar, but a different scale, right? And so AI ends up touching all of our lives, robotics, right? And like, like lots of different things. And so as you look into this, these have different power envelopes. There's different trade-offs in terms of the algorithms. There's new innovations in sparsity and other data formats and things like that. And so, uh, hardware innovation, I think, is a really good thing, 
right? And what I'm interested in is unlocking that innovation. There's also like analog and quantum and like all the the the, the really yeah. weird stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so if somebody can come up with a chip that uses analog computing and it's 100x more power efficient, think what that would mean in terms of the daily impact on the products we use. That'd be huge. Now, if you're building an analog computer, you may not be a compiler specialist. Right. These are different skill sets, right? And so you can hire some compiler people if you're running a big company, maybe. But it turns out these are really uh, like exotic new generation of compilers. <laughs> like this, this is a different thing, right? And so if you if you take a step back out and come back to what is the status quo, the status quo is that if you're Intel or you're NVIDIA, you continue you keep up with the industry and you chase and okay, there's 1900 now, there's 2000 now, there's 2100, and you have a huge team of people that are like trying to keep up and tune and optimize. And even when uh, one of the big guys comes out with a new generation of their chip, they have to go back and rewrite all these things, right? So really, it's only powered by having hundreds of people that are all like frantically trying to keep up. And what that does is that keeps out the little guys. And sometimes they're not so little guys, the big guys that are also just not not in those dominant positions. And so um, and so what has been happening, and so a lot of you talk about the rise of new exotic crazy accelerators, is people have been trying to turn this from a let's go write lots of special kernels problem into a compiler problem. Mm -hmm. And so we and I contributed to this as well. <laughs> we, we as an industry went into a like, let's go make this compiler problem phase, let's call it. And, much of the industry is still in this phase, by the way. So it's, I wouldn't say this phase is over. And so the idea is to say, look, okay, what a compiler does is it provides a much more general, extensible, uh, hackable interface for dealing with the general case, mm -hmm. right? And so um, within machine learning algorithms, for example, people figured out that, hey, if I do a matrix multiplication and I do a ReLU, right, the classic activation function, it is way faster to do one pass over the data and then do the ReLU on the output where I'm writing out the data because ReLU is just a maximum operation, right? Max is zero. And so I, it's an amazing optimization. Take MatMol, ReLU, squish together in one operation. Now I have MatMol, ReLU. Well, wait a second. If I do that now, I just went from having you know two operators to three. But now I figure out, okay, well, there's a lot of activation functions. What about... Uh, uh, leaky ReLU, what about like like a million things that are out there, right? And so as I start fusing these in, now I get permutations of all these algorithms, mm -hmm. right? And so what the compiler people said is they said, hey, well, that, cool, well, I will go enumerate all the algorithms and I will enumerate all the pairs and I will actually generate a kernel for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that this has been very, very useful for the industry. This is one of the things that powers Google TPUs. Uh, PyTorch 2's like rolling out really cool compiler stuff with Triton, this other technology and things like this. And so the compiler people are kind of coming into their fore and saying like, awesome, this is a compiler problem, we'll compiler it. Here's the problem. <laughs> not everybody's a compiler person. I love compiler people, trust me, mm -hmm. right? But not everybody can or should be a compiler person. It turns out that there are people that know analog computers really well, or they know some GPU internal architecture thing really well, or they know some crazy sparse numeric interesting algorithm that is the cusp of research, but they're not compiler people. And so one of the challenges with this new wave of technology trying to turn everything into a compiler is again, it has excluded a ton of people. And so you look at what does Mojo do? What does the modular stack do? Is it brings programmability back into this world. Like it enables, I wouldn't say normal people, but like a new, you know, a different kind of delightful nerd that mm -hmm. that cares about numerics or cares about hardware or cares about things like this, to be able to express that in the stack and extend the stack without having to actually go hack the compiler itself. So extend the stack on the on the algorithm side, yeah, and then on the hardware side, yeah. So again, go back to like the simplest example of int, right? Mm -hmm. And so what both Swift and Mojo and other things like this did is we said, okay, pull magic out of the compiler and put it in the standard library. Right, and so what Modular is doing with the engine that we're providing and like this this very deep technology stack, right, which goes into heterogeneous runtimes and like a whole bunch nice. of really cool, really cool things. Um, this this whole stack allows that stack to be extended and hacked and changed by researchers mm -hmm. and by hardware innovators and by people who know things that we don't know because <laughs> you know Modular has some smart people, but we don't have all the smart people. It turns mm -hmm. out.